everybody. I'm Hannah Owens, the Insiders Club hostess. You might know me if you're an Insiders Club member. And I'm here today to share with you a very special, special clip that was recorded this last week in an Insiders Club gathering with Dr. Carol Swain and Dr. Christopher Shore. You may know them from their fabulous book about critical race theory and how it is burning down the house. So go check out their bu that book uh, in that description box below. But before we get to that, I wanted to extend a special invitation to those of you that have not yet signed up to join our new conservative Patriot Army. Uh, Dr. Stephen's special guests are joining virtually September 3rd and 4th with patriots and special guests all across the world as we help you lead your families and communities to freedom without having to sacrifice your beliefs, values, or your God-given rights. So if you haven't signed up for that yet, you're in luck because this week, this week, we've extended our buy one, get one free sale uh, for another few days. So go ahead and get your tickets, get a free ticket while you sign up and be able to give it to a friend who's also a Patriot. So also click that link down in the description to sign up and get your free ticket when you register today and learn a little bit about, more about that. But let's get into it. I'd love to show you this interview. Enjoy. But yes, I'm not the only doctor in the house tonight. We've got several doctors. So this is great. Uh, that's right, Carol Swain is here. Um, Professor Swain is an award-winning political scientist and former tenured professor at Princeton and Vanderbilt Universities. And uh, if her name sounds familiar, it's because I drop it probably at least once a week. Her book, The New White Nationalism in America, was an amazing read. If I recall, Professor Swain, you published that in 2002? Yes, I did. You, so you've been on the... you. You were into this ethno-nationalist wave before it was even a wave. I mean, you were, this is, you were cutting edge on this one. And it was so controversial because I commissioned interviews of white nationalists and I actually allowed them to speak. And the thinking at the time was that I was giving them a platform and that we didn't need to listen to people like that. Mm. And I've always felt that what you don't know uh, can hurt you. And it's important to listen to all sides. And so it was research that was considered, uh, so it was welcomed by some people. They knew that there was a problem on the horizon, but others felt that I was giving them a platform they didn't deserve. Yeah, you wrote that in the, in the intro, if I recall, how, how important it was to you to make sure that we we're always have a, a, a dialogia, you know, a dialogue between one. Because if we start shutting down a debate, um, it's easy. It's easy for for it to fester uh, in ways that uh, open conversation can uh, can avoid. So, well, you, well, Professor Cass Sunstein, who was at I don't know, I believe the University of Chicago, well, he argued that it was important to have a dialogue because the last thing you want is extremists talking of one another. They become more extreme. But if you have a conversation, it tends to moderate. Right. Uh, and we see that we have totally abandoned that concept, uh, the whole idea. And what has happened is that the political left, it's gone off the deep end. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, it's, it's a brilliant introduction. And and I and I, I remember that. I remember that you brought that study into it, which was so good in terms of the importance of moderation, uh, the importance of dialogue for moderation. It's a, so good. Christopher Shore, PhD in American government from Georgetown University's dissertation, white nationalism, and its challenge to the American right considers factors at risk mainstreaming white nationalist politics in the United States, including critical race theory. And this is why I'm so excited both of you are on the program here because you're both so well-versed in ethno-nationalist studies and you're, you're drawing that in, particularly with white nationalism and now drawing that into finding parallels with BLM and um, I guess by implication, La Raza and all these other ethno-nationalist studies. It seems like we're moving more and more into a world that's either civic nationalist, i.e. Donald Trump, you know, multiple, uh, a plurality of ethnicities all united around a common civic 
nationalism like in Brazil or Russia versus an ethno-nationalism. It looks like the world is splitting up in those two groups. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. And, and the challenge from CRT in particular is it is a dagger in the heart of civic nationalism, right? Mm -hmm. And so then, because it, it attacks our, our civic nationalist identity as being a, uh, a fig leaf for white supremacy and systemic racism. So at its core, um, you know, the, the intuition that actually brought me to, um, to look at CRT to begin with, starting with looking at white nationalism based on Carol's work, um, but then bringing in CRT, the intuition was, well, what happens when you tear down those civic national ideas? And what happens when you attack a group of people on the basis of their racial identity and, and, their, and you attack their identity directly, whether it's whiteness in terms of their, their racial identity, or whether it's their national identity, calling it systemically racist and so forth. And doesn't that then in turn generate exactly the kind of the, the ugly kind of, of politics that you claim to be against, right? And um, so anyways, that's where my, my research went into um, critical race theory. And then uh, what was great was after um, finishing my dissertation, I was able to connect with Carol and it turned out that we were both interested in, in CRT as well as um, the broader um, you know, story of white nationalism and, and identity politics. Yeah, it's, it's such a fascinating field, uh, ethno-nationalism, and it's just so ripe the the uh, the heuristic uh, you know um, the frames of reference it brings to interpret CRT and bring some try to bring some sanity to it is so good. You two have a, a new book that everyone should know about. Hannah, we should link it down below in our chat section called "Black Eye for America: How Critical Race Theory Is Burning Down the House." Love that title. That is cool. I will hold up the book. <laughs> ah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> really? <laughs> and the forward was written by one Dr. Ben Carson. So we got a lot of doctors here. This is like a MASH episode here. I know, Dr. doctor, ben. doctor, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Normally I feel special on this channel. Not yeah. anymore. I'm, I'm, being, I'm being pushed out by all these uh, PhDs. What's the backstory to this book? What, uh, what drew you both to it? Um, what, in, what did you want to help your readers understand? I can tell you that I have been talking about critical race theory probably for about three or four years. And I've watched cultural Marxism and what, took, what, was, what has taken place on college and university campuses. And part of my story is I took early retirement in 2017 and I was probably one of the first university professors in America to be canceled because of, that was before we knew that it was, that I was being canceled, but I would say that I was canceled. And uh, what got me, the reason I felt that this book was important was that there were so many parents uh, asking for help, that my inbox was flooded with parents, teachers, uh, administrators, policymakers, trying to understand what was taking place. And at first the book was gonna be just a primer uh, to help people understand the concept. And it was gonna be even shorter than it is now. We wanted something that uh, would be manageable for people that would explain what CRT, CRT is, where it came from, why it's un-American, how it, why it runs counter to our constitution and our civil rights laws, and then we wanted um, strategies, which we have in the book for people to, to, that they can use to fight back that would be clear. And some of the things that we've done is that we have a glossary because there's so many terms. That's true. That's <laughs> yeah, true. People need to understand those terms. And uh, we have resources listed, including the model school board uh, language uh, for legislatures yeah. that are trying to do something at the um, state level. And so there was a need in this country for something that was manageable that people could understand. And so this book was written not for other scholars, it was written for the American people, something that you could sit down and get through in a couple of hours. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah, the glossary, especially when you have sociologists <laughs> and all their isms and and lawyers, my, if you have sociologists and lawyers together, you're gonna, you certainly need a glossary. 
obviously you're both so versed in uh, serious scholarship in ethno-nationalism. Uh, but uh, what, uh, Chris, what, what connections, what parallels would you see between, um, say, some of the rhetoric and sentiments and the ideals of white nationalists that you studied with those of, say, some of the more prominent BLM activists? Oh, that's interesting. So, so I was going to, my initial thought was um, the ethnostate connection. Now, I haven't seen that quite as strong with, with BLM, um, but, but I suspect it's there. I mean, you mentioned La Raza earlier. Um, there, there were previous groups of Black nationalists who, who talked about carving out the South. White nationalists famously think that they're going to have the, the upper Northwest somehow. Um, but uh, but um, uh, Mecha and La Raza um, obviously uh, have eyes on the Southwest, right? That's, that's mm -hmm. been, and that, that was, that's, that's kind of old news in some ways. That's like a 30 year old um, uh, project of theirs. You can go back and you can find, like from the earliest days of the internet, you can find um, uh, Mecha and La Raza talking about that. Um, I would say that in general, uh, they both reject the, uh, both sides of, I would, I would call them racial identitarians on the, on the right and left. What they reject at its core is is the American tradition and a civic nationalist tradition. But I would also I would push a little bit on the ethno nationalists. Um, the sharp line, Cone, you know, 1944, right? There's a sharp line between civic and ethnic nationalism. But we should remember that um, we're not just a bunch of ideas. We're also a people, and right. we're a people who have a history and a culture. And too often when, when someone hears someone say that, they think, oh, that's coded language for white nationalism. But it's not. But part of our history and culture is the contributions, in many ways, the outsized contributions of, you know, the 13% of our population have given us, you know, jazz, blues, rock and roll. <laughs> I mean, like, if you were to actually look at American culture and you were to actually um, look at uh, our culture as a product, you would find that it's actually uh, much of certainly a popular culture is disproportionately black. Right, and right. so I would say that even within the framework of ethnic and civic, there's a lot of common, uh, common sort of substance for us to, to, to kind of embrace, you know, as a single, um, as a single people. And then obviously what assimilation does is it's always kind of bringing in more people into that common, um, into that common identity. And, um, so I, I would say, but at its core, I would say it rejects the civic nationalist tradition, whether you're an identitarian on the right or the left, you, you can't have this, this common cross-racial conception of, of who we are as a people, right? And Steve, I would say that it really isn't so much ethno-nationalism, it's uh, progressives that have an agenda that's very much rooted in Marxism. Mm. They are using black people and Hispanic people and Asian people uh, to divide our nation, but at the end of the day, it's about their agenda, and they would discard those groups when it becomes useful to do so. So it's not really about um, uh, the, the groups. I mean, they have Black folks out there uh, parroting the leftist language, but at the end of the day, uh, they're being used, and some of them know that. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that that's a great segue into this of um, defining or describing CRT proper and its and its relationship to Marxism. This can be a little, you know, pretty bewildering for a lot of people. Can you just kind of give us a basic sense of what CRT is and how it relates to Marxism? Well, what I want to say is that it is racist. It's it's a racist, white supremacist ideology that the political left puts forward because they argue, you know, that in the US that all white people are privileged, that all white people are, are oppressors, even if they are born in Appalachia, parents never finished the third grade, all blacks are oppressed, they're victims, even if they're the children of a millionaire or, or a billionaire, they say the racism is permanent, that whites have to become anti-racist, but no other group. Uh, it's presented as if only white people can be racist. And so it's very much rooted in conflict theory uh, with, with economic Marxism. You know, there was a class uh, dividing uh, the cap, it was after capitalism uh, and, and the workers, divisions between the owners and the workers. But what they're doing with uh, critical race theory 
is dividing people along racial and ethnic lines in a way that there can never be any racial reconciliation that comes out of uh, critical race theory because it's all about dividing. And it's so racist because it believes that racial and ethnic minorities cannot compete on the same standards as more superior white people. So the only way you can get an equal result is by lowering the standards. And so they would, you know, they're doing it, getting away, getting rid of advanced placement courses. They're saying that math is racist and that teachers should not demand correct answers from racial and ethnic minorities. And um, they are removing standards for graduation and they're doing it at the college uh, level as well as K through 12. They're also resegregating America. And when you think about the progressives, they're Democrats for the most part. And the Democrats have always been, you know, the party of segregation. Mm. They've always been white supremacists. And so what I see is the same old white supremacy uh, being put forth. But unfortunately, the rest of the country, they seem to have lost their minds because they're not standing up for the civil rights laws or the constitution. Uh, they find it easier to go along with the mob rather than to stand on principles and values. Wow. Wow. So, so in other words, the, the uh, sort of the proletariat bourgeois divide of, uh, of class has now been replaced with color. It's been replaced with ethnicity and culture, right? The cultural Marxism as opposed to uh, a class-based and uh, economic uh, Marxism. And, uh, and we're seeing now uh, it being used to, well, as you're saying, and uh, quite literally in this book, burning down the house. It's it is. Wow, what an interview. And there's just so much more. If you want to hear more of this Q&A, as well as actually becoming a live participant and asking your very own questions to the movers and shakers of the conservative movement all over the world, then you need to join our Insiders Club by simply clicking on the link below. Every week, you're going to have special access to some of your favorite conservatives across the globe, and you're going to love interacting daily with thousands of your fellow conservatives on our group chat and posting platform. So make sure to click on that link below and join our Insiders Club and get your backstage pass to the worldwide conservative movement today.